Good morning, and if you are new here, welcome to Capital Life Church. We have a very special speaker today that we know that you all will enjoy, and that is our very own Dr. Julie Ream. So get ready and have your coffee or tea ready and enjoy the service. Hi, my name is Dorel Fisher. I'm a videographer and a video director here at CLC. And I've been here for about two years now, coming up, I wanna say coming up on two years, maybe two and a half, but. So in high school, I was very much a, like jack of all trades. Like I did a little bit of everything. You know, I was on the basketball team, on the football team, you know, was a manager for volleyball. You know, I was a theater kid you know, nerd, you know, studying all the time. So, and I was in all the little cliques and all that type of stuff. So it was very much a, you know, I just was a everybody's person. You know, I was always around somebody. Everybody knew me in high school and knew me for being like the loud, boisterous, almost like class clown type of person. But once everything opens up and you know the world is back to a little bit of normalcy i would love to go to either italy or japan or both you know just make it a a back-to-back -back thing <laughs> just go both ways uh i i always want to go to italy because you know i love i love the food there you know i love to go to just like a small town and have homemade pasta and linguine and all that type of stuff and um maybe learn a little bit of italian I always love just like how italian sounds <laughs> um and then same with Japan, um, Japan. I love to go to Japan and go to all the different stores and see all the little museums and shrines and all that type stuff. So yeah, definitely Italy and Japan. I have definitely been thinking about this more recently. Um, at first I really didn't care, you know, but now I definitely want to be known as, I want people to remember you as somebody who just brought joy, you know, wherever you went. Someone who was always you know, accepting of others, you know, making people comfortable whenever they saw me, you know, just a nice guy, you know, and just reliable. And I want my legacy to be that so that it's almost like synonymous with my last name almost. Like my kids will be known by that, you know, their kids, you know, to the point where they at school to be like, oh, they official? Oh, well, we don't really even have to worry about them. They're going to be doing their thing. But um, I just want to be known as the guy who brought joy, brought peace and made people feel good whenever I was around them.
praise Him forever. All that is within me, magnify His name. Great is the Lord our God. Oh, oh, oh.
is light and it burns brighter than the sun it steals a night cast no shadow there is hope so oceans rise and mountains fall he never fails His loveliness tonight. Hold on to hope. Take courage again. Death by love. The fallen world was over.
We have a few announcements that I want to share with you today, and two of them are huge celebrations. One is that Daniela and Jonathan got engaged this last, actually maybe it was two weeks ago, and so congratulations to them. And also Jenny and Mario Martinez had their baby, little Oliver Daniel, and he is so precious. He came early, very early, but he's very healthy and strong and at home, so they're all um, enjoying each other as a family. It's just so wonderful. So congratulations to the Martinez family. And also, the men had an amazing breakfast yesterday, and we are kicking off as a church a prayer time where it is a time to reset and reboot and rebuild. And we're praying for our country as it is going through so much transition right now and praying, of course, for our president and first lady as we've just found out that they have coronavirus. But we are just trusting the Lord. We know that He is good. And so join us in this prayer effort. You can find all the information on our website as well. And then also the Above All Else Ministries Retreat has begun and we are going through the book of Proverbs. We have a video each week. We encourage you to join us. You can find all of our information on our social media, Above All Else Ministries. And also we're excited to let you know that we're going to be having a movie night. It will be an outdoor movie in the parking lot. It will be The Return of Mary Poppins, which is such a fun movie if you've never seen it. So we're, we're going to do that on October 17th at the church in the parking lot. So come early so you can set up your blanket and your chairs and we will have popcorn and pop. So it's a Poppins popcorn and pop night. And it starts at 6.30 and then we'll start the movie at seven. So don't come late because you'll be setting up in the dark. We want you all to have really great seats. And so I think that's it for announcements, but we're just so thankful for you. And because of your tithes and offerings, we are able to do what we do. And I really do encourage you to pray about your giving, pray for us as a church. This is of course a challenging time. And so let me pray for you now as you give, if you wouldn't mind just pausing your computer and giving online, you can go to Capital Life Church. No, it's capitallife.org, but also, um, for the movie night, we want you to RSVP, and I forgot to mention that, so that would be capitallife.org slash movie night. So let me pray for you as we're about to give in the offering. Father, we pray that you will bless each person. First of all, we are just so thankful for your faithfulness in carrying us through this unusual time. We know that you are our source, and we pray for every individual going through this right now, that you'll just bless them, that you'll encourage them, and that you'll provide. So we pray you'll bless this offering, in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Victoria, and this is my husband, Boris, and we're the prayer directors here at Capital Life. And today we're beginning our 21 days of fasting and prayer. Uh, we hope that you'll join with us to just consecrate yourself before God so that we can all be completely ready to move into the next season of our lives personally and in the life of our church and our country. And during this time, church, we're going to focus on three themes. We're going to focus on reboot, reset, and rebuild. It's going to be a great time of renewal. We're going to start today and we're going to go all the way to October 25th where we're going to celebrate with a worship night. Come on, church, join us in the prayer and fasting for Capital Life Church. Welcome to Capital Life. We are so glad you are here. We are in our Tell Me More About God series. We've heard some incredible messages from Pastor Bill about the love of God and the names of God, as well as Pastor Lisa really reminding us about the goodness of God, her powerful story about how God met her in a place of disappointment. Uh, we heard a few weeks ago from Pastor Andy about what it means to be a relational God and how he calls us to do the same. And today we're going to talk about the subject of the God of hope. As you can see here, uh, he calls himself in Romans 15, 13, the God of hope. He says, may the God of hope fill you with peace 
and joy as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope as he fills you with the spirit. So what does that mean that he is the God of hope and what does it look like to live a life that overflows in hope? We're gonna unpack that today, uh, but wanted to share a recent study with you first. It's actually the Snyder Hope Scale. You can actually Google that if you're interested. It's 12 questions that you can take to gauge your hope level. And what this study found was there was a direct correlation between people's hope levels and all different other areas of their life. I love it when social science backs up biblical truth. And what they shared was that people that had higher hope levels had better mental health overall. They performed better at their jobs. They had way better medical histories and lived longer, as well as better relationships and social interactions and had overall well well-being. So we're going to look at today what it means to live a life, as the scripture calls us, overflowing with hope, if you'll pray with me. Father God, we just thank you that you call yourself the God of hope in scripture and that you pronounce over us that you desire to invite us into a life that is overflowing with your hope. So we just pray that you would lead us today. We just thank you so much for your word. We just pray for empowerment from the Holy Spirit. I just pray, God, that you would touch each and every person that is listening. I pray that you would be reminding us how personal you are, how much you love us, how you want to walk through every step of this life with us and how you want to infuse your hope inside of us. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to share with you a story about a woman actually here at Capital Life, and she gave me permission to share her story. Uh, it actually has some heavier parts to it, but I think there's such a powerful message within it and reminds us about what we just read about, the God of hope, how he intervenes in our life, how he wants to speak to us, how personal he is. Uh, we'll call her Katie. I actually met with Katie this week, and she was sharing with me several years ago, she was in a place where she she would call herself hopeless. She had just really learned some devastating news that she just looked at me and with tears in her eyes said, I just didn't think I had the strength to make it through the next several years. She actually got to a place of such hopelessness that she was contemplating suicide. She said she started researching, jumping off the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and even went to Home Depot and purchased a rope that she kept in her garage. She did not tell her husband. She didn't tell any of her friends. Uh, they knew that she was walking through a harder time. But interestingly, her husband, um, right before this had invited her to come to church. He had started watching church on TV. God uses all different kind of things. We love the internet. We love uh, how God can come and meet people exactly where they are in their homes. He had just been flipping through the channels, stopped. He um, similarly was walking through a really hard season and he just stopped and started listening to this message. And he said, you know what? I think that we should give God a chance. I think we should try that church down the road. She says, if I'm being honest with you, I had no interest in going to church, but he seemed like he really wanted to. So he, she was like, you know what, I'll try it. She said when she walked in the sanctuary, she began to flood with tears. She said, I didn't know the words to describe it back then, but the presence of God overwhelmed me in such a way that I was enveloped in his love. The hopelessness that I was feeling, I was still battling it. Uh, you can love God and have an encounter with him and still be walking through pain and struggle. But she said as they sang the worship song, she just felt like liquid love was flowing over her. She began to go to church, but she was still in that place of battle. And she began to ask God to show up in her life. She ended up sharing with a pastor uh, just some of the circumstances that she was walking through. And he was able to encourage her. He prayed over her and just reminded her, how, again, how personal God is, how much he loved her, how he saw her circumstances. He remembers her, that it was no accident that she had walked into that church, that she had encountered God there, that he still had a plan for her life. But she said the phrase that stuck out to her most in that conversation was he encouraged her, hold on to 
hope. He said it over and over and over, hold on to hope. And so she left that day trying to dig deep in that place of saying, even though there's places that I feel hopeless, even though I don't feel like I have the strength to walk through these circumstances, I'm going to try to hold on to hope. Well, later that week, uh, she and I actually went to, uh, it was a fundraiser for a wonderful organization here in Arlington uh, that raises money for domestic abuse. And uh, it was a breakfast and they had all these different tables around a ballroom and the tables were named different encouraging words. Well, guess what table she and I got sat at? The table that we got sat at was called Hope. And she had told me uh, what that pastor had said over her. And she had told me, I'm just really trying to hold on to hope. I mean, do you feel like that's a coincidence that we got sat at the table of hope right after that scripture and that truth had been declared over her? But wait, the story gets better because God likes to show up on the scene when we ask him to be real to us, especially when we're in a place of desperate need and we're crying out to him. So we're going around the table at this breakfast and we're introducing ourselves. Guess what the woman's name sitting next to us was? You guessed it, Hope. Can you believe that? I mean, come on, Jesus. He wants to show up with hope pervading our lives when we need it the most and just reminding us of who he is, that he loves us, that he sees us, that he knows us. But the story does not end there because that's just how good God is. She was actually at a kickball tournament later that week because her husband plays on a kickball league and they were short players that week, so they needed every single person to be out on the field. And one of the players had his dog with him. So he comes up to Katie and says, will you hold on to my dog? Uh, I'll give you one guess on what her dog's name was. (laughs) Her dog's name was Hope, I kid you not. And the phrase that the pastor had said a few weeks ago of hold on to hope, those were the words that he said. He said, can you hold on to hope? But then he added even a caveat because the dog was really rambunctious. He says, hold on to hope tightly. And she said in that moment, she just knew that she knew that she knew that the living God was speaking to her, that he had had that pastor speak those words over her, that he had sat her at the table of hope, that the woman next to us was called hope. And then he he had some random guy who I don't even know knew Jesus said, hold on to hope tightly. God will speak through as we're listening, as we're looking for hope. And I'm going to fast forward three years later in her story. I was with her this week. And just to be real, she's still walking through a time of struggle and trial. Sometimes our circumstances don't just magically get better, but God gives us an internal strength and character and gives us his presence to walk through them. She started tearing up again when she was talking to me and she said, if I had not chosen to go to church that day and if I had not listened to the words of that pastor and seen how God showed up in my life in this area of hope, I honestly don't know if I would be here today. And I had just shared with her that I was gonna be uh, sharing a message on hope And she gave me permission to share her story because she said, you know what? I feel like there's so many others out there that need to hear you too can hold on to hope. When you feel like things are desperate, when you feel like things are too much, when you don't know where to turn, the living God wants to be, just as it says in Romans 15, 13, the God of hope and empower our lives, as it says in that scripture, to overflow flow with hope through the power of his spirit. So just wanted to encourage you in that today, what area do you feel like you need hope in? And sometimes we're going through life so busily that we don't even notice that our heart is discouraged or that we're not believing with the same level of faith or contending in the same way that perhaps we have in different seasons. Some of you, as soon as I asked that question, you would know exactly immediately what area. Uh, Maybe it's your marriage, you're wrestling, it's either in a harder place uh, or you're having the same fight over and over again and you don't know how to get out of it. Uh, Maybe you're wrestling in a season of singleness, which I'll share with you a little bit about my journey in a minute in that area. 
maybe it's financial, maybe it's this pandemic. I mean, how, how many of would have guessed that in 2020, we would still be in a global pandemic and all the different repercussions, it just wears on your heart. They say that mental health uh, resources are being requested more than ever in the past 20 years because there's a desperate need for hope. Uh, how much more uh, do we need supernatural hope from God to see things from his perspective, to be reminded of who he is? Uh, so I want to um, talk to you today about how do we hold on to hope? And that's actually the name of my message, thanks to the kickball guy. <laughs> <laughs> he named my message. Uh, first, hope is a choice. There's a quote by Brene Brown that says, like most people, I always thought of hope as an emotion, like a warm feeling, a feeling of optimism and possibility. I was wrong. I was shocked to discover that hope is not an emotion. It's actually a way of thinking or a cognitive process. Um, Recently, I did a study by Carolyn Leaf. It was actually a group of women here at Capital Life, and we studied her book, and she talks about hope in there and talks about it being a lens through which we choose to see life. And uh, John Calvin, who was a theologian in the 1500s, had an analogy that I love. He talked about how scripture is like glasses and you put on glasses and you're able to see the world rightly. I remember the very first time that I ever put on glasses um, back many years ago, I didn't even realize that I had poor sight until I put on glasses and I was like, oh, all of a sudden I could see the leaves and the tree before they were kind of green blobs. And in a similar way, sometimes we don't even realize that we're not seeing rightly or seeing the full picture or the clarity until we look through the lens of scripture. And scripture invites us to see through the lens of hope. There's a quote by Bill Johnson that says, any area of life that we are not seeing through the lens of hope, we're actually believing a lie because the God is the God of hope and he wants to infuse hope into those situations. The biblical definition of hope is not wishful thinking, as in, I hope this happens, but rather it is divine, defined as joyful and confident expectation. We can look for the goodness of God, even in the hardest situations. And Pastor Lisa shared about that a few weeks ago when she shared her testimony of her miscarriages and how she had to, in that place, choose to cling to hope. And it wasn't easy. It's You can know something cognitively, but to choose it, I believe, is costly, which is actually my second point. Hope is costly. Uh, to choose hope, especially when we're in a place of disappointment or there's past pain or there's unanswered prayers for years and years and years, it is costly to choose hope. It's easier to shut our hearts off and just say, you know what, this is how life is. I'm not going to engage my heart. I'm not going to engage with God. I'm not going to choose to believe because often when we choose, there will be disappointments or things will not happen the way that we pray. And I know that all of us can relate in one way or another to that. I know for me, uh, walking out singleness has been something for years that was something that I didn't expect. Um, it's been an area where I've had to consciously choose hope. It's been an area where I feel like after years and years of prayer, it has still been at least not answered in the way that I was expecting. And to really go to God in that place and to say, I believe your goodness in this place. I believe who you are. And I believe that you want to lead me to a place or you were reminding me who you are and helping me choose even before a prayer is answered to trust in your goodness in that in-between place. Um, Zechariah is our key passage for today and it's Zechariah 9, 11 through 13. Uh, Zechariah was one of the Old Testament prophets. He was a contemporary of Haggai. Uh, he lived uh, post-exilic time, which means that after the period of captivity, uh, many believe that he was born in Babylon, but he got to go back and return to the city of Jerusalem and be a part of the rebuilding of the temple, as well as to be a declaration of the coming Messiah. He was a prophetic voice during that time. So knowing a little bit of the context of the scripture that we're gonna look at, I believe helps us unpack it. Uh, they had been prisoners 
for years and years and years. Uh, there was 586 and 722 BC were the two times of where Israel was taken into captivity. And during that time, they were prisoners. And it's interesting in this passage, he's calling them to be a different type of prisoner. Uh, it says, as for you, by the blood of your covenant, I have freed your prisoners from the waterless pit. In scripture, water will often represent the Holy Spirit or will represent the presence of God. So they were in a place where God felt distant. Return to a fortress or the biblical definition can be a safe place. O oh, prisoners of hope. And again, they were in captivity previously, and this time God is calling them to return to a place of captivity, but instead of a place of a literal or physical captivity, he's telling them to be captive to hope. What does it mean to be captive to hope in our lives? He says, this very day I announce I'm restoring double to you. Uh, one of the many, many things that I love about the Lord is that he is a God of restoration. That is who he is. That is his character. Whenever you have walked through devastation or loss, the Lord always wants to rebuild. There's always an invitation. Uh, Romans 8, 28, we've heard about in the recent weeks. Uh, John Ballinger shared that was one of his favorite verses, as well as um, both Pastor Bill and Lisa have preached on just that the Lord promises he will work all things together for the good of those that love him. And I believe that that is a promise for us today. We start to look for how is God's hand at work in this place? And again, it doesn't mean that the situation in and of itself is good, but we're looking for what God is doing and what he is saying in the midst of it. The last part of that scripture says, for I have bent Judah as my bow and I have set Ephraim as its arrow. Uh, when you look at the definition for Judah, it actually means praise and the definition for Ephraim means strength. And so there's a direct correlation between praising God and receiving his strength. Um, one of them is the bow and the other is the arrow. Uh, when we are praising God, and I think especially before the answer comes, then we are able to receive his strength in that place. Or as the scripture that we started out with, Romans 15 talks about a supernatural infusion of hope in that place. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. What areas of your life do you feel like hope has been deferred? What areas have you had past disappointments? Have you had places of pain? Have you had places where God hasn't come through, at least not in the way that you've expected? We need to take a gauge on our heart and see if there is any offense towards God. God can handle us being raw and real before him. What he wants more than anything is our hearts. And looking and seeing, is there any way that I've distanced myself from God? Is there any way that him not answering a prayer or circumstance that I walk through or loss that I've experienced has affected my trust level with him. One of the things that has helped me, I mentioned my singleness earlier, is that we can be in a place where we don't understand fully. Uh, there's a scripture that I love that in Philippians 4, 7, and it says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I think about that scripture and it's saying, if you have to choose between peace and understanding, peace actually trumps or is better than understanding. So often, uh, we want to understand why something happened, and that's totally natural, totally normal, but we just can't camp out there because there'll be things that we will never fully understand this side of heaven on why certain things happen or why God would allow that. I believe that God is grieved over so much of the suffering and so much of it is uh, the misuse of free will. But there's also things that I don't understand, why somebody wasn't healed in a situation. I know um, my older brother has actually walked through manic depression for years, for close to 30 years now, and it has been something that I've prayed and contended for. Our whole family has fast and sought the Lord over, and he's definitely had times where he's been more stable. He uh, lives in a group home in North Carolina. Unfortunately, right now, he's actually in the mental hospital because he's had an episode recently, and I, that's one of those areas that I 
just don't understand. I don't fully understand why he's having to walk that out here on this earth. I don't understand why he hasn't had healing, but I do understand that this world is not his home and that he was not made for this place. Um, there's a scripture, Hebrews 13, 14, that says, this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home that has not yet come. And I believe that my brother Christopher helps me understand that scripture in a way that I never naturally would. He and I love to talk about when I go visit uh, Revelation 20 through 22. If you are having a hard week, I encourage you to go check those passages out. It's about the new heaven, the new earth. It talks about how we will receive a new mind and a new body. And whenever I read the word new mind for him, I just tear up thinking about he is going to be fully healed. He is going to be fully himself, who he's always meant to be. And he had to walk through a suffering on this earth that I'll never fully know. I understand it from a place of loving him. But one of his favorite books is actually The Last Battle uh, for you C.S. Lewis fans. Uh, he read this book when he was younger and always remembered the ending. Uh, C.S. Lewis makes a powerful analogy about how this world is really just the cover and the title page, but the real story begins in attorney. That's the story that we were made for. And so I was going to visit Christopher one day and he was just having a harder day and he asked me if we could go to Barnes and Noble and go buy the book, The Last Battle. So we went and bought it and he said, will you read me the last page? So I'll read you what I wrote him, or what I read to him. And I just want you to think about this for your life because this world truly is not our home. And when we make it our home, we see through a skewed lens, but we're able to have hope in who God is and what is to come and the real place that we were made for when we remember that this is just the title page. It says, but for them, this was just the beginning of the real story. All of their life in this world and all of their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, there were the beginning, chapter one of the great story, capital S, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And he and I both had tears in our eyes as I was reading that to him. And then I'll never forget what he said to me next. He asked me if he, I could reopen the book again and if I would read it to him again. It was like he was renewing his mind in that place that this world is not his home. And then by that point, I lost it. <laughs> I was like in tears and we were both talking about what it'll be like to be with Jesus and to be reunited and that he'll be fully well and we'll have our glorified bodies. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Um, so I just want to encourage you in that place. Um, and some things that we will see the answer to this side of heaven and other things we won't. And to keep our play, keep our hearts fully alive, trusting in the goodness of God related to my singleness. I'm actually dating somebody wonderful now, and I will say that he has been totally worth the wait, but I will say that I never imagined my story to be what it was. And one of the most powerful things that I've received during that time was learning to trust God in the place before the prayer comes answered. And just wanna encourage you in that place today. Uh, my last point is that hope is contagious. Rather paradoxically, if you wanna hold on to hope, one of the best things that you can do is to give it away. When we give away hope, when we speak hope over other people, when we help other people see what God's perspective might be in their life, that he is up to something bigger, that he's at work behind the scenes. Uh, I think about um, Katie in the story that I shared in opening, that hold on to hope in those places because you never know what God is doing. And she, again, wanted me to share her story today because she wanted her hope to be contagious to you that God is real, that he remembers you, that he sees you, that he wants to infuse his hope into those places that you might be battling. Psalm 33, 18 says, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, whose hope is in his unfailing love. 
and uh, just felt like the Lord was wanting me to remind you that His eyes are on you, that He sees you, that He is calling you to be one that chooses hope even in those hardest places, and that you ask Him who you are meant to infuse hope into. Maybe it's you're supposed to reach out to somebody. Maybe it is somebody that's going through a harder time. Uh, we talked about even the extremely hard topic of suicide today. And if you're in a place where you are wrestling with those thoughts, I want you to know that you are not alone and that we as the church, that is why we are here to walk through things with people. Um, no matter what you are walking through, we also have resources and mental, mental therapist specialist that we can point you towards. Uh, maybe it's another area of your life that you feel like you need an infusion of hope um, or it's somebody else that God is laying on your heart. Maybe it's just going and being present with somebody. Never underestimate the ministry of presence when somebody is walking through a hard time and just being there with them. And I believe that your physical body can be a manifestation of God's hope in their life, of his love in, in, in their life that he is with them and that he's sending others to walk it out with them. Uh, I have three challenges um, to close because I believe here at Capital Life that we are called to be the headquarters of hope. You might have heard Pastor Bill and Lisa and others say that's one of our mottos, our phrases, that we feel like God has called us to be a place within the D.C. area where people can come and find hope. As you know, uh, for those of you that live in the D.C. area, it is not an easy place to live, uh, especially 2020 has its unique set of challenges with uh, walking through a pandemic. How much do we need the message of hope today? Uh, uh, my heart has been grieved over the racial injustices that have happened this year. It is tragic and that grieves the heart of God. And we as the church need to stand up and be a voice and be a beacon of hope uh, to our community of what it means to love well. And I believe that's what um, God has actually pronounced over Capital Life, that we are meant to be a place that walks out what a multicultural biblical community is that loves each other well. And we have room to grow in it, but it is our heart to grow and to be a voice that speaks truth and love in those places. Um, also, political climate, I won't go too much into that, but that is heated and we need hope in those places. We need a place where people can, I love that Capital Life is a politics free zone where our focus is to build bridges for the gospel and you're able to just come and fellowship even with people that might be on different sides of the aisle. And our focus is to love Jesus together and to be reminded that our citizenship is not here, but our citizenship is actually in heaven. And our primary focus is to build the kingdom of God. So my challenge, my final challenges to you relate to the three points that I shared. And the first one is hope is a choice. What area again do you need to ask God to increase your hope level? What area do you need to partner with the truth of God? As we talked about, uh, even with the Carolyn Lee study, is that there's a real invitation that we have to renewing our minds and coming in agreement, uh, just as I put on glasses earlier, to see the world and to see our circumstances through the lens of hope to see what scripture says. Scripture invites us to a higher perspective, to see things from God's perspective, what he is doing and what he is saying. And we can't always see it with our natural eyes, but God, as we look for him, just as our story with Katie, when she started to look for hope, hope was all around her. So I just wanted to encourage you in whatever area or areas that you are feeling like you are needing hope. And then the second one, I challenge you in the area that hope is costly. And perhaps it's an area of past disappointment or unanswered prayer, or maybe even something that you're walking through right now that you are consciously and intentionally having to choose hope, having to believe in the goodness of God. Maybe it's even looking at past places and saying, has my affection or heart for you, God, been dulled in any way? Is there any offense there? And if there is, just to spend time with God. He is so kind. When we take one 
one step towards him like we see in the prodigal son. He comes running towards us in that place. More than anything, he just wants our hearts. And so if you need to ask hard questions or even reach out to a counselor or a pastor or a trusted friend to help you process those places, God is calling you to live with a heart fully alive to him, trusting his goodness and reminding ourselves that this world is not our home, that we're never going to fully understand, but we're able to give costly worship to him, even as it says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, David says, I will not offer the Lord that which costs me nothing. We're able to choose to worship him even in those places before the answered prayer comes, even when we don't have full understanding. And then last but not least, hope is contagious. Who might God calling you to speak his hope, to see things from heaven's perspective? Maybe it's as we talked about the ministry of presence and it's just walking along somebody or being with them in their place of pain. Never underestimate what a gift that is. I think Jesus modeled the ministry of presence to us and asking God, who am I meant to reach out to at this time? Who am I meant to share? Maybe it's even being a part of a group here or being a part of one of our outreaches where we get to practically demonstrate the love and hope of God. So just challenge you to ask God, who am I meant to be that source of hope? Even as we heard about in Katie's story, uh, one of my favorite things about Katie's story is God speaking to her, but also God delights to use us to be physical representations and to speak his hope. Uh, she had the pastor that spoke his hope. She had uh, the lady that it, just by introducing herself and even the person that sat us at that table and then the kickball guy that said, hold on to hope, hold on to hope tightly. God may wanna use you to be that same anointed voice in somebody's life, which is actually Father God speaking to them. So if you'll close in prayer with me. Father God, we just thank you so much for your kindness and your deep, deep love. I thank you that you know us, that you remember us, that you wanna walk through every step of life with us. We just thank you for your promise in Romans 15, 13, that you want to help us overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just pray that over each and every one of us right now. I just thank you so much for Capital Life Church. Lord, I thank you for the term that you have spoken over us to be a headquarters of hope and I pray that you would continue to use us in such powerful ways to be a beacon of light and hope to this community uh, to the DC area Lord, we just thank you for what you are doing and what you are saying in our life and we just pray that you would help us renew our minds as you call us to in Romans 12 that we truly would see this world what we're walking through in you through the lens of hope we love you and we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's powerful and holy name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks again for joining us for service today. I wanted to remind you as Boris and Victoria shared, the 21 day fast starts today. So we're gonna have a time of prayer and fasting. And if you are wanting more information about that or wanna check out our prayer points uh, for the next three weeks, you can go to capitallife.org slash 21 day fast. I encourage you to join us as we seek God and uh, we'll be building up to our worship night on the 25th. Also wanted to invite you to our virtual foyer, which happens right now after service. Opportunity to connect with other CLCers. If you're new, it's a great way to say hello, find out more about Capital Life. So we'd love for you to join us.